All right. Well, I hope everybody's clicking on the notebooks and going ahead and just hitting that first cell to, to fire it up. Um, <clears throat> welcome back. So we've been talking about just the basic pick and place. And we actually got pretty far with the la last time using the differential inverse kinematics approach. We were able to you know, have a fairly complete solution that planned um, you know, a motion for, to move the brick from one bin to the other. And actually, we're not gonna do much more than that today. We're just, it's just that the, with the tools we've developed, uh, we're so close to having something we can use for a very long time. But we need just a little bit more work to make this controller that we wrote a little bit more robust. So um, the way that I like to do that is with optimization. So I'm gonna use this also as an excuse to give a bit of a crash course on optimization uh, so that we can use it because we'll use it heavily. Thursday, we're gonna start using uh, talking about perception and we'll even use optimization again then. Okay, so um, I'm gonna do most of the lecture on this whiteboard and I've got, I hope, a, an awesome breakout. Um, at least I, I worked hard on it. I don't know if it's gonna be awesome, but. Oops. Okay. So um, the basic idea we talked about last time, we had the forward kinematics, but we went to the differential kinematics uh, last time, right? So we wrote that we had a, a spatial velocity that we wanted of let's say the gripper in the world frame. And we talked about the relationship that we could make between joint velocities here. Lots of these flying around. And this is our, our spatial velocity. And that's the Jacobian, right? Okay, now this relationship is not an approximation. This is just, this is true, right? That was a great discussion, by the way, on, um, so we started it on Slack, uh, if anybody hasn't joined the Slack, but I actually ended up putting it into the course notes if people um, haven't seen it. People were, we were asking a lot about whether the, um, the Jacobian was an approximation, and this was a great sort of thought. I, I enjoyed it as a thought experiment of just taking a two-link arm, reaching out. This was Dale's example last time. You reach out, you hit the singularity, you reach back, so this is actually this little animation, which will run on, um, I forgot I shared my, uh, my whiteboard before I showed the video. Bad news. Anyways, there's a cool little animation on the thing. It's probably not worth switching back. Well, maybe it's worth switching back. So there's an example in the notes motivated by that, that conversation, Dale's example here of, of a two link arm that's just going straight out and back. Okay, and the reason I think this is kind of a cute example is that the angular velocities are constant. They're not doing anything fancy. I'm just playing a constant angular velocity until I turn around and play the same opposite of in that uh, angular velocity. So there's nothing fancy going there. This is going into singularity and out. The Jacobian goes in, is, is uh, not invertible at the end. You can actually see the Jacobian when the thetas line up, it's just zeros, sine of theta is zero. So you get zeros all across the top row. It's clearly, I'll stop that because that's maddening at the end. Um, okay, so it's constant velocity, but the Jacobian can be singular. You can still come back, but you cannot instantaneously accelerate back. That is also true. You can have, and, and the reason that, that happens is that you get, if you look at the position over time, when this, of this simple open loop thing, you get two cosine one minus t. And the derivative of that is actually zero. You can accelerate back, but you cannot instantaneously command a velocity back. So that was a good experiment. Thank you for that. Um, all 
Okay, so this is just the truth. And the, whether the inverse or exists or not is also uh, sort of unambiguously true, right? Then we talked about inverting it, but doing it with the pseudo inverse. That's what we did for our controller last time. We took our JG of Q, we did the pseudo inverse, right? And let's say this is now, let's say our gripper desired, okay? And this now can work, but may not, right? And when I say it won't, when it say not work, what do I mean? I mean, there might not be, you might be able to command a spatial, a desired spatial velocity for which there is no velocity, joint velocity that works, or an impractical, you know, that if you're close to singularity, which is what it tends to happen, you might take an impractically large uh, uh, joint velocity to make that work. Okay, now by the end of lecture, I want you to, I hope you'll appreciate that it, it sort of wasn't fair. We didn't give this controller a, a fair go. We kind of wrote down something silly and you'll see it geometrically. It, it's just not the right way to write down a controller and we're asking it to do something it's not capable of doing. And there's a natural way to make it more robust. And like I said, it uses optimization and if we get it right, we'll use this controller for a, a, for a, a long time in the lecture. So um, the way I want you to think about it is I want you to first understand this idea of the pseudo inverse as an optimization, as the result of an optimization, okay? <clears throat> so really what this problem, what this equation we're, we're doing is, is accomplishing, I mean, I told you that the pseudo inverse has some amazing properties, right? That it, it makes its best effort when the thing isn't feasible. And the reason for all that is because you can think of this as, as the result of an optimization. So what I would prefer to write um, is the sort of its natural form here is that we're gonna say, we're gonna try to find some V subject to the constraint that JG of V is approximately equal to our spatial velocity. Okay. And this, um, I wrote JG and I put my parentheses in the wrong place. You guys can call me on that if you see it. <clears throat> okay, so this is, you know, I see this as in linear algebra, AX approximately equal to B. And we know a ton about it, right? It comes up all the time, right? So, um, Let's just, I'm gonna be a little bit methodical on it um, and, and draw it out because I think the visualizations we get in the super simple cases are gonna carry us through hopefully to the full kinematics cases. All right, so let's just think about this even in the scalar case of AX equals, you know, we want it to be approximately equal to B. Okay, so how does that look, right? I've got some X, I've got AX that goes through the origin, right? My slope is A. If I have some B here, then there's some solution here that I, I want to get out here. I'll call it X star, right? Now, in the case, so, so if we write AX equals to B, then the only answer is X star, okay? But sometimes you can imagine cases where, for instance, if A goes near zero, right, that, that X star would have to be ex exceedingly large or might even not exist, right? So there might be, it might be that we want a, a, a more robust way to ask this question. And the more robust way to ask this question would be to say, find me the best X that's feasible, right? So just find me the best X. So minimize over X AX minus B squared, let's say we can just even use normal parentheses when it's a scalar. AX minus B squared. Okay, so what does that look like, right? That looks like um, now I've got something, my quadratic, I've got a quadratic bowl here. I've got X 
star here and there's some function that when I'm at the right solution, it's zero. But I've got a cost function there. It's quadratic, right? If I multiply that out, I get an x squared. This is my b here. This is my a, my x star. I get something like this, right? Now I'm going to try to convince you over the course of the lecture that that's a better way to write it. Because when we get into higher dimensions and stuff, there might be a case where you can't actually drive the error to, to zero. You can't get that to zero. But you can, um, you know, by saying, do your best effort subject to the limitations, uh, we, can, we can have a more robust solution. All right, so I mean, just to write this out, right? So if I multiply that out, I get what? x a squared, x squared minus 2ab. bx plus b squared, right? Now, how do I find x star in this example? Right. Well, a, a positive quadratic function, the defining feature of that minima is that it's gradient, the gradient of that function is zero, right? So if I take the gradient of this with respect to x, what do I get? I get 2a squared x minus 2ab. I want that equal to zero. So I get x is what? Negative b over a. So does that always have a solution? This is, I mean, let me use star for the, for the optimal always, okay? Does that always have a solution? Well, we already saw it in the picture. If a goes to, um, to zero, then I've got a divide by zero problem, right? And I, I won't have a solution, right? Right. And the picture there is is maybe maybe worth drawing, right? So, as I change um, a, so I had let's say I I had um, let's say b equal to one. I'll do a equals to one in the first picture here, and that gives me some bowl here like this. If I start making a equal to two. Then my solution moves out this way, and my bowl gets a little fatter, right? And if I were to double it again, I'm sorry, I one half, that was one half, not two. And a equal to one fourth, then I'm going to go out even further. with a super shallow quadratic function, right? And that's how that thing goes bad in some sense, okay? Plus, um, there's a comment that there should be no negative sign on x star. Oh, thank you. Good call. And I'm drawing it all in the positive quadrant. Thank you for fixing that, yes. All right, so here's the key idea. And I think if you understand it here, you're gonna, it'll make sense. Um, I mean, it's simple to understand here, I think, and it, I hope it'll carry through and make everything make sense in the more complicated robot case, right? Let's say for instance, I'd like to minimize X subject to AX minus B squared but I'm gonna put a constraint on it saying X shouldn't go crazy, right? Subject to, I don't know, X, absolute value of X is less than two. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take my best effort there, but I'm gonna put some rails on the system. Give me the best one that fits under the, but don't ever go outside of neg between negative two and positive two, right? So now when, you know, a is greater than zero and starts going towards zero, my X star will hit two and stay at two. That's the fundamental thing that's gonna keep us from going crazy at the end. And by the way, you'll see it in the problem set, but that the, the controller we ended up with at the end of last time works great when things are slow and happy in the middle, 
you get to the kinematic singularities, or you just ask for it to move too fast in the up against the um, the limits of the robot in the middle of the workspace, things can go bad. Okay. Is that clear? Is that does that idea sort of land? Pretty pretty, I think, um, visual. All right. So and this is this is fundamentally why I prefer writing thinking about it and writing it as a minimization like this. I, I prefer that's fundamentally why I like, you know, AX approximately equal to B. That's sort of like a suggestion which can be satisfied even with different constraints being imposed. Whereas AX equals B is like there's no room, there's no wiggle room. There's no room to like add extra sensibility into the into this solution. Okay, so the exact same thing happens in the matrix case, and it's you know just to exercise our um, matrix parts of our brain here. So if I want to talk about AX approximately equal to B in the matrix case, let's say I prefer to write it as minimum over X, AX minus B squared. We can solve it without any constraints first. And if you multiply this out, then you get x transpose a transpose a x minus. You get sort of the, the same things happening here. So if you think about how that multiplies out. Oops, x transpose a transpose b minus b transpose a x. Those are the cross terms, right? Plus b squared. Now. Every, this whole equation is a scalar equation. So this, the, these two look different, but they're really not. Right, so I, that whole thing really is just minus two X transpose A transpose B, just because the whole thing is a scalar. So the, the transpose of any one of those elements is just this, the same thing. Okay, and then we can take the gradient Again, so if I take the, the derivative of that thing with respect to x, it's a little bit maybe less familiar, less comfortable, but it's totally doable, right? So 2x transpose a transpose a. Now minus, um, I should have done the other way, I guess is a little bit better if I had written it. Just take the transpose of what I wrote before b transpose ax, then it's easy to see b transpose a, and this contributes nothing to the gradient that last term. Okay, and that thing should equal zero. So if I solve that away, I get x transpose is um, b transpose a, and then I right multiply by this a transpose A, that whole thing inverse. If I take the transpose of that, this, guess what? Is just A plus. I mean, it's with the transpose right now, but that's the pseudo inverse. And that is actually how you derive the pseudo inverse. The pseudo inverse is not a magical, mystical thing. It's exactly the result of writing this optimization problem down right here and solving it. And that's why it's um, cool and robust, okay? So my optimal solution, if this is, the cool thing is that you can separate out the problem data from the, you know, the solution. So I can write X star is A plus of B. My pseudo inverse. Now, if you wanted to visualize that problem that we did, right? I mean, I drew the, the quadratic forms up here, right? That's sort of, you know how to draw 1D quadratic forms. Now, the, the picture I want you to have in your head here is now I have x1 and x2, but now I have my 3D plot here, where this now is um, uh, 
and I get a bowl here, right? That comes down to some optimal value. And wherever it land, whatever its minimum is, is my X star. So the shape of that bowl is determined by the, the quadratic term, right? If I, if I look back at, the, at this original equation I did, the breaking up that, there's a couple of components. There's a linear component here. There's a constant component here. So let's just think through it. The constant component actually doesn't change what the optimal solution is going to be, but it lifts the bowl up or down. The linear term will move it around and change the objective, change the minimum. But it's this thing, it's the quadratic term that cha changes the shape of the bowl. So, you know, what is the shape of that bowl, right? So, how would I even draw that? Oops, I'm still in my grading mode here. Well, the way I think about it is, so, so good things happened here, right? So A didn't have to be um, any special matrix, but when I multiplied it by A transpose, I got something that's special. I got something that's symmetric out. This is symmetric, which means it has real eigen, it has eigenvalues, the definition of eigenvalues and the real eigenvalues. So if I think about the eigen values and vectors of this matrix, they are the vectors vi that for which multiplying by that big matrix is just multiplying by a scalar. Then those define my principal axes of the of the ellipsoid. Right, because when I, when, you know, if I choose X to be some scalar times this, times one of the eigenvectors, then X transpose A transpose A X is just gonna be lambda I alpha vi vi. Maybe a lambda uh, alpha squared, alpha squared. Okay, so this, you know, that thing there, good Lord. That thing there is just my, uh, is, a, is a simple quadratic bowl quadratic form. So if I were to look along the axis of one of those eigenvectors and eigenvalues, I'd see a simple quadratic bowl with that looks like this. Okay. If I look along the other one, I'm going to see a simple quadratic bowl. Okay. So I can draw these things. If I now look down from above, then I'll have, let's say, V1, V2, two eigenvectors, and I'll get some quadratic form, some bowl. This is like the level sets of the bowl. If I'm looking down into the serial bowl, yeah? And it's coming up out of the screen towards me. And the way I've drawn it here, if I have this is lambda two, and this is lambda one, which one's bigger? Lambda one or lambda two? You can hold your fingers up. 
Lambda one or lambda two, the way I've drawn it. Actually, lambda two is bigger, right? That means it goes up faster. Right, as it goes to zero, things are going to be flatter. And as it, as it, you want, you know, a sharper coefficient means you're going to grow faster. But I admit that's not very elliptical, ellipsoidal, I'm sorry, um, bad drawing. Okay, so, so given that now, if I start to lose rank in this picture, what happens? All right, so my eigenvectors could stay the same. If I just start changing the eigenvalues, that means one of them is going to zero, right? That means my bowl is going to, just like it, we did up here, when alpha went to zero, right, the bowl sort of opened up like this. Same thing's going to happen here. I'd expect that when, um, you know, as, as let's say lambda one got very small, that this thing is going to sort of become just a trough. And that's bad news if you're commanding velocities based on you know, some numerical thing that's looking for the bottom of, of, your, um, of your bowl. Okay, So it makes sense to start putting constraints on there and say, give me, yes, give me a solution. But when things start going, you know, when if velocity, I don't want a very big solution, I'm going to put some rails on the system. OK. So the solution here, for instance, would be to um, start adding constraints. Now we could add the same kind of norm constraints if we wanted to, but more generally, we can add linear constraints. This is a quadratic function. And you put those two together and you get quadratic program. Okay. Um, quadratic programs are, do, I mean, the, the fact that we could write that pseudo inverse line and solve the, the optimal solution perfectly, that is unique to the, in this, in the, for our purposes today, that's something you can do in the unconstrained case, but you cannot do in the constrained case. And I think you'll see in some of the visualizations that once you start putting constraints on, you still have this beautiful quadratic bowl, but the, finding the minimum value of it depends in some potentially complicated way on those constraints. So we have, but we do have good numerical solvers. In the case where, when, um, when this thing is convex, and that's a convex, you know, convex, quadratic programming, that's the case where we have really good algorithms. So it's convex when the matrix, when the bowl is going up, all the eigenvalues are positive or zero, semi-definite. Okay, so we're gonna be doing a lot of optimization. Let me just be clear. This is, the X's here are my decision variables. This guy up here is my objective function. These are my linear constraints, my constraints. Any questions on the sort of general picture of this? Yeah, I had a question. Um, can you reiterate why when the solution's going towards zero, that leads to your control actions blowing up. Good. 
So um, in this very simple picture, I, I, I put it at the origin and that's sort of okay. But the, the better picture, got too many windows here, is this here. Because the thing that happens, not only does your bowl get, get shallow, but the minimum part tends to leak off towards infinity. If you're asking for any non-zero effort or movement, then the solution that it's going to give you is screaming towards infinity. Good question. All right, so what's the right way to put um, constraints on our Jacobian base controller? I mean, the simplest one we've already got, if I, if I want you to think of now about the thing we've already written is this, right? It's exactly what we wrote before in my mind. And the solution to that is the pseudo inverse. And that's the controller we've been running. This is just its other, it's, it's more optimization based expression. But if we want to keep it from going off to infinity, I mean, we've got a decision variable right here. And we probably in practice, we definitely have the KUKA, you know, yeah, we have velocity limits on the, on the robot, right? So it's very natural to put in if you have some minimum velocity and some maximum velocity, just say that, give me the best solution you can, but don't exceed the velocity limits of the robot, right? In this case, I'm talking about, a, this is an element wise velocity limit. you might even choose to set artificially conservative, right? Because you don't necessarily want, um, you know, to be living at the, the maximum possible velocity of your robot, but it's at least less arbitrary than the, you know, X less than two that I used up, up there. But there's other natural limits that your robot has that can, you know, you could throw in this problem, right? So what if we have joint limits, right? Now we don't have Q as a decision variable, but we know the current Q. So the right way to write, I mean, a, a reasonable way to write a joint limit into this kind of Jacobian based controller is to say, I don't want to hit, I don't want to exceed my joint limit in the next, you need some characteristic time constant. So I typically call it H, H seconds. So I could add that as a very coarse approximation, something like Q, which was just known at the optimization, it's not a decision variable, plus H V I would call that an Euler approximation of the integral, right? Really, we would have some, we would integrate the velocity over some time to get the, the, where Q is actually gonna be in H seconds. This is just an, a first order approximation of that. The other thing that happened here, to write that, I assumed Q dot equals V, which I said, I like even had a section saying, don't assume Q dot equals V. But um, the Q dot not equal to V is when you've got floating joints and the like. You're not trying to do control through a floating, a free floating joint. So in, certainly for the EWA in most of these cases, in this example, it's okay that Q dot is equal to V. If, if it wasn't, there's other ways you could do it, but.
there's actually a bunch of other super interesting constraints that we can add to our system. Acceleration constraints, joint centering terms. We can, we can, uh, we'll go through a few more of them, but instead of just like hitting you with a wall of possible constraints, I wanna make sure that we take that picture, those, that intuition of that quadratic form and start playing with it a little bit. So, Let me show you what's going to happen in the breakouts here. I'm going to just going to give you a, a quick uh, preview, but then you can you see so you can fire this up on your own whenever you're ready. I'm sorry to be if you look at the zoom again for this. All right. So this is I've given you a simple interface where you call visualize. You give me. Q and VG desired. This is for my two link robot. So VG desired is actually just two numbers. It's the, the translational velocity in X and um, Z actually. Okay. And it'll print out the two dimensional Jacobian. And that all makes sense when you see what popped up. Okay. This is what you're gonna play with. It's all interactive and good, okay. That's your two link robot. It's, I didn't like putting them in the same image just because they're in a different coordinate system. The optimization is in velocities of the joints and the robot is, so just think of the robot as like a, a little reminder of what's happening, okay? And um, now let's see, you've got a quadratic bowl that's happening. The blue is off limits. Those are your constraints. Those are just velocity limit constraints right now. Forgive me for the clipping. I will get that done later, but that's just, that's not there. That's, those are just lines. I was a little sloppy in cleaning up. Okay. And the green dot is the minimum. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can um, work with this. I've got a, a bunch of different interfaces. You can animate the joint trajectory. You can play with the sliders. On the, along a trajectory, you can do the joint sliders, whatever, and you can just print out the, um, you can just call it on a, you can just change the numbers here and, and call that. But if you do, for instance, run the animation, you'll see how that solution is moving over time. You know, the, the, you'll see the quadratic form change and shape what happens when it goes in and out of singularities, all this good stuff, okay? Um, and then I've got a couple questions that I'm gonna ask you about it. The one more thing I just wanna make sure you see here, in the notebook, you can mess with the mathematical program if you want. So there's the way you write a quadratic, a QP problem in Drake, we have a, a, actually a, a pretty advanced um, optimization interface. So things look like this. You say, um, you know, make a new mathematical program, make some new variables. You'll get to play with this on your problem set. You can just say, my error looks like this, J, G, V, minus V desired. You can add that as a cost, add constraints. You've defined a problem and it's plotting based on that problem. So if you were to add or change different constraints inside the mathematical program, it's actually just introspecting on the mathematical program and, and plotting whatever you do. So feel free to, to play around. Okay, so we'll do the breakouts now because um, I, I didn't want to get too far before you start playing with that visualization. There's some questions linked. It's both at the top of the collab and at the on this slide here that will hopefully guide you. and watch, you know, you get to watch QPs do their thing. I think you should, yes, thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Sure. Is um, in new continuous variables, is that first argument, is that like the initial guess? 
Nope. You just when you start with the, it's, it's basically your you have to define your decision variables. Say I've got a blank slate program. It's got no decision variables. It's got no objectives, no costs. First right. step is tell me what the how many decision variables do I have? Oh, okay, got it. Yep. Okay, you have physical intuition now. I hope of the QP. So there were a couple of questions at the end there that were just open ended, but we could discuss now. But so did you understand? You understood that those boxes on the bottom were the constraints, and they were all one joint at a time kind of constraints. In fact, if you had position, you know, both of the proposed constraints I wrote had that form. So what would it take? What's a natural constraint that you might actually want to watch, right, that would somehow couple the multiple joints? Maybe the distance that the end effector is from the base. Cool. Yes. Anytime you, you put something in an end effector uh, constraint, maybe there's like a wall you don't want to go near, right? That would be another good reason to uh, a, a reason to expect coupling. Right, so how would you even write that kind of a constraint, right? So um, now you have this picture, I think, of there's a quadratic bowl, and you can imagine the al an algorithm that would find the minimum, right? If you just put a marble in the bowl and let it go down and didn't let it go past the constraints, everything's good. But that algorithm gets doesn't work anymore if you somehow had non-convex constraints. If you had like a obstacle in the middle of the of the region, you could get your ball could get stuck, right? So it's that's the reason we restrict ourselves to linear constraints, is that that you can you can't make a non-convex region with a bunch of inequality half-plane constraints. Okay, so but you could end up with those constraints being you know, diagonal lines in that in that picture, right? So if you had, for instance, what if you said like the position of the gripper maybe in the world um, frame, even in the world X, which is a function of Q, had to be less than or equal to three, let's say, I don't know. There's a wall at three. Now you can't, you can't write down something that like avoid the coffee cup because that's, you know, that would be a non-convex constraint. But if it's somehow a wall, or if locally you're near something that might be non-convex, but you're okay for approximating it in the short term with a convex thing. You know, this is a nonlinear function, we know, but we could approximate. You know, something like P of the gripper in the world frame approximately equal to, well, sorry, the, the next gripper um, is going to be the current gripper's position plus H times I Jacobian times V, right? Maybe that thing being less than three, this is given to me. I can compute the nonlinear function. So this is just a constant in the eyes of my optimizer. You know, this is a constant. All this is constant. This is the only decision variable. So that is still a linear constraint. There's a couple other good ones, right? So um, I've talked about them a bit in the notes, but I want to dig into them a little bit here because they're not they're non-trivial. So um, <clears throat> One of the things that we you you one of the things that I saw for sure when when we were running the diff IK controller that we've got already is that um, since we have seven degrees of freedom and we're only controlling the task in six degrees in six um, variables, the the non important variables tend to walk a little bit. They're, they're, we're not control we're not specifying them well enough. We're giving them an, an arbitrary 
um, you know, norm centering in the velocity, which means try not to move roughly in velocity, which means that you're going to end up with your elbow sort of, if you were to do the same move over and over again, you would slowly walk away from what I would consider to be a comfortable position of the robot. So you can do things right in this QP that help you with the sort of joint centering. And there's this beautiful idea from um, Jacobian-based control of taking the null space of your Jacobian, okay? So um, if when in the case where we have, for instance, a six by seven um, Jacobian, we know it's got, if it's got rank six, then it still has a null space of dimension one, okay? So there's an idea that, um, that you can use that null space to do the last bit of work, okay? So um, <clears throat> let's call We have to be a little careful about it. The null space is a subset of your, it's a, it's a space, subspace in, in, in the linear algebra sense. So let's call P a matrix that projects into that, into that null space. We would typically pick it to be a, some orthonormal basis of that null space. Now there's a couple ways you can get it. The standard way we tend to get it um, we've, we've traditionally gotten it in, in robotics is you find a lot of equations that write it like, um, you know, I minus my Jacobian, Jacobian pseudo inverse. So you can actually use your pseudo inverse to get that. And the, if you think about, if you think your way through this, then the, you take the pseudo inverse, you multiply it by the original thing. The only thing that can be left has to be zero along the, the elements that are in the null space. And so that gives you a, a version. I don't need you to understand that, but just think about the P being a, a way to parameterize those extra variables. What's the dimensionality in my linearization of the, of the extra variables? And then you could do something like this, right? So what if you did minimize V um, by JG Q V minus spatial V. This is my original objective, okay? But I could tack on something like this. I also want in the null space, the null space is going to be a function of Q also. Um, I'd like V um, to be, let's say, approximately like a centering controller. Okay, so this would be, you know, I'd like V to be approximately like a linear controller that's taking me, I should have said, uh, minus is okay, yeah. I want Q nominal minus Q here. So I should have flipped those around. Q nominal minus Q here. I'd like this to somehow be going, um, you know, in a linear way towards the comfortable position. But if I multiply it by this thing that projects me into the null space, then this thing will only ever add cost in places where it doesn't affect my primary objective. Sort of a beautiful idea, okay? And in fact, in the unconstrained problem, this does exactly the right thing. You still find, you know, you haven't changed the solution, the, the objective value that you would get from here um, on this side, because you've only done things in the null space. If, however, you do this and you add extra constraints, you know, my, even my simplest constraints then things can get a little bit more slippery. It could be that because you're active on a constraint, this, these things can fight a little bit. And I try to talk that through in the notes. In practice, we can just resolve that by putting a small, you know, a, a small value in front of this. Okay, but the intuition now is I have my primary controller that's trying to do my end effector spatial velocity control and you know, behind the scenes, when it doesn't affect my main task, try to get back to that comfortable position. <clears throat> All right, so the goal, you know, today here is to give you something that we can use for the rest of the class. Uh, <clears throat> the thing we are gonna use in the rest of, this cl of the class is a, it's a system in the main Drake library, which is the differential I won't write out IK, we write everything out in Drake to be super clear. It also has the integrator. 
attached. And it's actually not using any of the formulations that I showed you so far, but it's close. And that's, and it's actually in a cool way, it's a little bit different because once you get into this world of you're willing to solve a small optimization problem on every time step, a convex optimization problem at every time step, there's a lot of different formulations that become available to you, right? And so <clears throat> the one that has been our workhorse um, for, for our research has been just a little bit different, which is um, we try to say, it's okay to slow down if you're trying to violate your constraint or if you're about to violate some constraints, you know, it's good to put limits on things, put rails th on things, but we don't want you to ever leave your path. Okay. So for instance, you know, just this idea that be as close as possible in some, you know, arbitrary um, X coordinate system, you know, might mean that when I start slowing down, I might actually drift off my intended course. So you could put an explicit constraint on saying, you know, that I'd like at least the direction of my solution to be in the direction, but you're willing to sort of slow that down. So if you, you have to think about like, how would you write a control uh, in optimization like that? So you could start with your, and you could say something like, well, how, you know, how would you write it? Have you thought about how to write it? Some of you might've seen it in the notes already, but how would you write that? I think a good way to write it is to say that um, I'd, like to, I'd like to be as close as possible, but actually I only need JV to be equal to some approximate, um, scaling times V, my spatial velocity. And it takes a little bit of work to convince yourself that actually it's okay to just scale down spatial velocities. Um, and you wanna make sure you only scale them in a reasonable way. And this adds one more decision variable to the problem. Now that's a linear equality constraint because I've made, you know, I've got decision variables that are here and here, but they still, the whole thing can be written as a linear um, equ equation in those variables. And of course, if I can handle inequalities, I can handle equalities too, by just making this into two inequalities that are exactly tight. Now, if you're clever though, I think this is, this is once you've done this, you actually don't need that quadratic objective. You can, you can flip things around and there's this whole sort of, um, I don't know, it's like a, a trade of, of, of optimization where you kind of learn the right way to write constraints that make solvers really happy. And you know the, the, the math gets you very far. And then there's some like, I don't know, just pattern matching or some, some, um, some skill, I guess, to, to find the right formulations. But in general, we prefer linear um, objectives to quadratic objectives. The solvers can do better on that. So it turns out once you've done this, you can actually write an equivalent optimization that's just try to maximize alpha subject to this. And that should do, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing. We've given up a, we've changed our quadratic preference to the, to a linear preference, but since we're always positive and we're hopefully always near one this is basically it doesn't matter okay um i have a question yeah uh, for the differential ik optimization if you plugged in alpha vg into the objective wouldn't you be trying to minimize alpha vg minus vg norm squared uh say say it one more time i'm you're are you pointing me here, up here? If you plug in the first constraint, equality constraint into the objective, right? Yep. Substituting G JV, wouldn't you always find like alpha is one? Um, you would like it to be one. You, you, this, would, this is saying, push me as close as possible to one. Okay. I think, you no, know, you're exactly right. And that's the point. That's, that's exactly why you can just reduce that whole objective okay. just doing this. But you're, yeah, I think your substitution is exactly right. But why, when would you not be able to 
get to... Oh, 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 good. So if J if JG loses rank, okay, one case, or if you have additional constraints like what we saw in the in the demo, okay, right? No, good, good. So that's super important, right? That that'll if in many cases this thing should just obtain alpha equals one, but if JG loses rank, then it might not be able to, right? Or if you have the other constraints, okay. Yes, good. Okay, any other questions about that? I mean, it still takes a little extra work um, to, to, it's not enough. This is not enough to protect you from going, let's, let's say I, I used a big complicated motion planning system and I designed a nominal trajectory. And I said, um, okay, I'm gonna execute that. I'm allowed to slow down, alpha is allowed to slow me down but I'm just going to sort of open loop play my spatial velocity commands. Antonio, Antonio uh, uh, asked the question on, on um, Piazza about why do we actually, why do we go to spatial velocities and then back? Super good question, right? And this is a, one of the places where it could um, get you in trouble because if you were to, you know, go into spatial velocity space, slow down, and then your commanded trajectory sort of goes ahead. If you were to just blindly command the spatial velocities that you were, uh, you were planning to, to, to do in an open loop tape, then you would actually deviate from your trajectory. And maybe you planned to go just around some obstacle, you could slam right into it. So it takes a little bit more effort on the outer loop if you were to try to execute some trajectory to make sure you stay on that trajectory. But at least at the instantaneous level, you're not already deviating from the trajectory if you do something like this. Cool. Okay, well, I hope that was like an introduction to optimization. I mean, I, I, I'll try to see how much I can get out of that tool later uh, as we get into nonlinear objectives and stuff too. But uh, you could sort of imagine that, um, that that problem was special because of that quadratic bowl and those linear constraints. And there's places like the full inverse kinematics problem where we'll be able to visualize it the same, but you'll see why it becomes a harder optimization problem. So let me go back here and uh, put that up as always. Tell me if it was worth all the effort I put into the, the visualization. I thought, I think it looks cool, but, um, you know, be honest. Was it worth it or was it kind of like, yeah? Well, cool. thank you very much. I mean, I'll, I'll stick around and answer a couple of questions if anybody has them, but otherwise we will see you Thursday. There's a question on the chat about... Uh... Okay. Yeah, so, so that is an equality constraint, which says, I'd like the direction that comes out to be proportional to the commanded spatial velocity. So basically, where without that constraint, you're going to try to get you know, minimize the objective, but you um, you could do it in arbitrary directions, right? So that quadratic bowl, you could, if the constraints came in, you might you might go up the bowl in any direction. This one says, if you have to move away from my ideal minimum of the bowl because of a constraint, do it along the direction that only slows me down. So the, the VG that I get out will be proportional to the VG I commanded as opposed to closer, it might be, in fact, you'll always be better if you have less constraints, it, you know, so you might get something that is closer in your objective function sense, but that takes you off the path. Adding this constraint will keep you on the path instantaneously. Um, would it be possible to go over the first problem that was in the breakout rooms? Because I think me and the other people in my room were a little bit confused about, um, it was like the Jacobian times the Jacobian inverse or something like that and the eigenvalues. Good. Yes, I had to just pull it up to remember which one was first. Um, good. So, um, right. So, so you could look at the um, Jacobian. It was something like zero, zero, you know, negative two, negative one. The way you would compute that would be then to multiply 
JG times JG transpose, JG transpose times JG, and then just take an eigenvalue decomposition. If you were to do that in, um, uh, in NumPy, it'll give you some numbers that are like, I don't know, norm, they're scaled to be unit norm one, but it's really just um, a scaling of one and negative two. So these are just the, this is one of the eigen vectors, right? There's two elements in the eigen vector of the matrix, JG transpose JG, a lot of, but I also am perfectly happy if you were to just like sort of look and understand that that, why that axis is sort of always long in that one direction, right? And even if you were to move the velocity command around, it doesn't actually change the shape of that. Hey, um, can I ask a question about the pseudo inverse? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I just saw a derivation for it in a different class, but um, I guess I was reading a little bit about this, but in the other class it was defined as like J transpose uh, parentheses J, J transpose inverse. Um, is that equivalent to the... Um, Right, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't transpose the whole thing, and there's also a left and a right um, form of it. So uh, yes, they, apart from being a pseudo inverse on the left or pseudo inverse on the right, it should be some, you know, transpose away from what I showed you. Okay, cool, thanks. And then I guess my other question was the. Um, uh, it seemed like from the derivation that the, the thing you were minimizing was um, like JV equals uh, VG. Um, but I think in the class I saw the derivation, we use like Lagrange parameters and the forward kinematics was actually the constraint and we were minimizing the um, norm of uh, the like joint velocities like Q dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So um, there are, um, yeah, there are a lot of different formulations out there. We actually thought about putting that one on the, on the piece set, but um, yeah, you can, you can have your um, commanded velocity there's a, there's a bunch of different things. Yeah, I've seen the version where you put V squared as your objective, and then you put some form of, of the equality constraint um, as, a, as a hard constraint. I think they're all, I, I, there might be a subtle reason why one is better than the other for a particular application, but they're all in the sort of same family. If you have a particular one you want to show, I'd, I'd be happy to look. But the message is, um, once you get into the space, there's a couple different forms that you can all, you can move around between pretty comfortably. Oh, thank you. Sure. Hi. Yeah, I had a question uh, regarding the, the scaling uh, down of velocities, uh, going back to that. So wouldn't it be true that scaling velocities wouldn't prevent you from reaching like a singularity, uh, considering that the Jacobian is a function of Q, not V? So just slowing down, you would still go through that singularity, right? Right. So the the only thing that's going to prevent you from doing is commanding ridiculous velocities. But I see. Okay. The whole point is, and the other controller, even if you don't have that constraint, there's nothing explicitly reasoning about staying away from singularities in the other one. Okay. It's just saying that when a singularity happens, bound my response. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Good question. Yeah. It's interesting to think how if you could. I mean. Yeah, it, it would be a higher, you'd have to have some higher order thinking about what that singularity would look like. So I think it would be hard to, in a linear, in a quadratic program, avoid a singularity that way. But mm -hmm. there could be, you could make first order approximations of it maybe, but. Thanks. Are, are there any uh, disadvantages to bounding the response when you have a singularity? Like, is that gonna somehow, I mean, is that a, a complete solution for dealing with it? In many of these cases, the, the constraints are real. Uh, like, I actually, so in fact, I would argue the opposite way is if I didn't, if I wrote down the pseudo inverse and I didn't list the velocity constraints and I make, I make some velocity command, which my real robot is actually going to clip at the API level, then the, I'm not going to get the velocity I think I'm going to get anyways. So in some sense, we're just letting our decision maker in the pseudo, in the, the, the least squares problem here know about the constraints that are real. So in that sense, you've lost absolutely nothing, right? It, it's, it's a better thing to do because you will say, give me the as close as possible to the velocity I've commanded 
being realistic about the constraints. So you will actually get a better result, you know, by 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 telling it about the true constraints than it versus something that would clip afterwards. Like if you just solve the least squares problem, the thing you might compare it against is just solving the least squares problem unconstrained and then having somebody go in and just enforce the limits afterwards. And that will always be worse. I mean, there's cases where they can be equivalent, they'll be the same or worse. Could you explain why you need to have the epsilon factor on the secondary control, uh, secondary constraint for our like secondary objective? Um, yeah, yeah, totally. So in the case where there's no constraints, you don't need it. It's magical. It's good. You stay off in the null space. But um, but if you if you do have constraints, then you are no longer um, in this luxury of like having a v that was independently chosen in the null space. And those constraints can be coupled. I should. It'd be good to find us like the, the minimal example that shows those coupling, those couplings. But um, I'm trying to think if I can come up with a quick one. Yeah, it's, I mean, I guess just just from the optimization side, we know that you can't expect those things to be uh, independent. Obje the ob objectives that look independent can be coupled by constraints. So except for very rare situations, you wouldn't expect those to be, um, to stay mutually exclusive. You got, the, you got the reason that it's sort of, you know, it's small, but not too small and stuff like that, right? I, I think the, the sense of how do you choose epsilon means, I mean, it, the fact that you can choose it like pretty small, and like, that's why I called it epsilon, means that it really in practice, like it will rarely be when the constraints are active and then when those constraints are active, it will have a very minimal effect on your real controller. So I think in practice, you get almost complete separation with that approach. But if you wanted to do a more complete separation, there are ways where you can solve hierarchies of QPs in order to do a strict prioritization. Say, absolutely solve this, understand the manifold of optimal solutions, and in that manifold, find, a next, you know, find another solution. It's just computationally harder. Okay, so basically the constraints, I guess what I'm confused about is how adding the constraints means that projecting into the null space isn't good enough. I'll try to come up with like a, a two dimensional example, maybe even a, a visualization. Okay, thanks. Can you, I wonder if we can see it from even what we did today. It's, it's hard in 2D to, to um, you have too many objectives. Right? You'd have to have like, uh, you know, two one-dimensional objectives. <laughs> um, but you could see that. Okay, maybe that's enough, right? So imagine you had two one-dimensional. You know, let's just say I have one objective x squared, one objective y squared, right? And and so normally they will never clash, and it's all good. But if I put a linear constraint that that is x plus y is less than one. Mm. <laughs> Then you start you write up against one, and in order to you know you get their state, they start interfering with each other. Yeah, so you can see it in two D. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Russ, can I ask a question? I just uh... totally. So yeah, I was just wondering. Um, let's say uh, someone had this like. Um, basic QP controller based on like uh, minimizing the JV minus V um, with joint velocity constraints. And then you want to come in and persuade that person that it's better to actually put in joint centering. Won't be like your go to example of, um, won't be like a demonstration to prove that it's better. Uh, so, so, say it again. So, the velocity based constraints versus joint center, oh, the joint centering constraints? Right. I mean, won't be your like go-to demo to show that if you actually add a uh, you know p times uh, the the position controller stuff it, it becomes better like how do you is it more stable or i see okay it, compared to not having that term at all right right okay i so it, it actually happens um and it would happen in our simulator uh just from integration you know errors if you, I mean, really, if you pick that up over and over again, the the Jacobian from the pseudo inverse, you know, or which is the same thing you'd get 
if you didn't have that constraint and you had no other constraints, right? In the null space, it will just choose the minimum norm solution, which is like in the null space, it's choosing the smallest possible joint velocities, right? Okay, so if you think about what's gonna happen as you move back and forth, it's like in the dimensions that don't matter, you're adding like an unnecessary drag. So that it would be the difference if you've got a comfortable position of the robot with your elbow bent at a certain place, the difference would be, you know, I really, if I, as I go back and forth, I, I would see my, my one controller would just have like a droopy elbow and the other controller would stay in its sort of nice centered position. And it's not just like, I don't like droopy elbows. It's, it's that you are, you're not fully specifying the task, right? You're leaving it to some relatively arbitrary process. Uh, the, the command of, you know, basically one of your joints in the high dimensional space. Now there's a, there's a version that didn't use P like the version actually that's in, that's in Drake master right now, doesn't have P in the objective and I'm, changing it to make it have P in the objective. Right, it just goes uh, directly SVD and then constructs the null space out of that? Or... Um, I mean, P, so the SVD trick is just another way to get the projection matrix P. Right, right. But the reason that, um, so, so basically, if you don't put that P there, then your objectives will compete even in the good cases. Right, even when you're not up against constraints, the stuff Antonio was work, was asking about, you really have to hit like a weird case in order for those to couple. Once you've got P, um, keeping them decoupled most of the time, it's only when you have like a weird constraint that couples them, and it, you have to be active against that constraint for it to be anything, right? Uh, right. Did I answer your first question, your main question? Yeah, yeah. But could you actually hurt yourself by having a bad nominal position? Oh, um, it seems like. Yeah, just as as a first sort of impression, just when I first saw it, it seemed rather arbitrary that you have this nominal joint position. You know, um, I mean, we 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 had one for Atlas. It was kind of like this, you know, uh, the the Q zero, right? And and every once in a while, we'd be working on it for a little bit. Someone would be like, I think I want to change Q zero a little bit, and then they would recap <laughs> it. There's like all these you know, these sort of un uh, unstated assumptions on that Q zero hiding around there. But um, I mean, I've also seen a version of the diff IK controller that it was like undamped effectively in the in the low dimensional. And, and then it was just kind of, you know, if even if you're just trying to stay in place, the elbow was kind of going, wah, 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 right? I think you'd never want that, <laughs> right? How do you choose Q0? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, you know, we put the robot in a pretty happy place. Say that's a, say you know when when things look good they look kind of like that we we'll call okay. that Q nominal. Okay. Sorry, hard. and I, I think I'm still a bit confused on the objective here. Why why is the VN in here? I would think that you just like try to minimize the difference between the nominal and your actual position. I'm looking at the yeah in that objective. There's like PQ times V and minus K Q not minus Q. Why is the V? I, I had to introduce V N to just, um, I mean, oh, I, really this, that particular equation, I didn't need oh, yes. N. Uh, I could have just called it V again, yes, but that's what's I had to introduce that just above uh, because when you had accelerations, I needed to distinguish between the current velocity and the commanded velocity. Okay. But so, I, I, I would think if, if the purpose here is to try to keep our position as close to the nominal as possible. Yeah. Why do we need to have the velocity in there at all. What's yeah. the point of that? And I would think you would just have a constraint on Q not minus Q squared. Ah, really good. Okay. So um if you want to find the relationship between two I totally understand the question. In fact, uh, we have that version implemented too. And the problem with it, I think, is that um if your objective is basically in the null space, be as close as as close as possible to Q0, then that's effectively saying, I want you to get back there in one step, right? And this is a softer response. This is saying, wherever you are, you don't have to get back to that in one step. Yeah. Just try to go way. back in that direction. Add a proportional response compared now, to you know, it up. pulls you back in that direction. <laughs> All right, that makes some amount of sense. Right, so, so in practice, if you had 
uh, if you just said Q, that, that, so I, I, yeah, I'm very glad you asked the question. So if you just had Q zero minus Q and Q was approximated like we did above as you know, Q plus H V, mm -hmm. right? Then I think you would basically be, you know, trying to get back there as much as you possibly could all the time up to your saturation constraints. Uh, okay. And the V is sort of like dampening that a bit. I'm doing dampens not the correct I'd say that K, yeah, by, but yeah, by doing it in, in velocity space, um, you are somehow dampening that. You're, you're, basically, you're trying to say make a smooth response to correct any off center. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, I don't know when you have to run, but I had a question about the first question in the breakout session. Okay. Um, so the, uh, so we were asked to find what ultimately like ended up being the eigenvector corresponding to the zero eigenvalue of JT transpose J, but that kind of like, um, like level set, I guess, of the cost was like non, like it had uniform, like it had zero cost, I guess. Um, is that generally, or is that because, was there special something special about this like specific minimizer that, that like satisfied something there? Like- uh, You're asking how could you still have an eigenvector uh, that's along this weird trough dimension or something? Well, like the eigenvector of JT transpose J dictates, it, it, it's like, there's no incorporation of V in there, right? But V somehow like, seem to play a factor in the fact that you could go anywhere along that line with X and still achieve the same minimization, right? Yes, but you, I would say the same thing about any quadratic form, right? That X, the, the actual solution, I mean, there's, you, you analyze your matrix Q, if you will, uh -huh. in order to understand what happens in X. Okay. That part I'm okay with. Okay. I think, well, I, is is that is that okay? I mean, there is a subtlety I think where if you were to have multiple eigenvectors of zero, you might not have have a unique. So if you if you had multiple dimensions with zero eigenvalues, you wouldn't necessarily have a unique basis. And then my question would have been like, you know, too arbitrary. But okay. in the case where you have exactly one uh, zero eigenvalue, you there should be a unique coordinate for that, right? Okay. Okay. I mean, that's true of any repeated eigenvalues, but. Okay, got it, thanks. I don't feel like I completely answered it, but. Yeah, I, I don't know if like I fully like formed my question well in my head. I, I might ask it next lecture. <laughs> ask it again, yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, I'm gonna sign off, but thank you for all the questions. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.